All right, so a question I often get on a lot of my videos is how I get such good footage with my Insta360 GO 2 on my FPV drones. So instead of uh, retyping that answer over and over again, which is a pretty lengthy answer, I'm going to make a video, which is actually I'm not sure how long this video is going to be. It kind of depends. We'll see. Try and keep it concise. But uh, there's a number of things that I do that helps with um, getting a better video quality out of this camera. It obviously has some limitations and I'm going to explain some of what those are and how to work around that and get the best possible footage that you can out of this tiny 27 gram camera. So first off, you want to make sure that you're on the latest firmware, the latest firmware which came out in February of 2022, uh, about a month ago. It um, contains some bug fixes and some fixes an issue with some um, ex auto exposure problems on this camera. So you definitely want to get that um, because if you don't, you might have some weird problems in your footage. So the next thing that you want to get are the ND filters for the GoTo and here are a few of them here. This is a set uh, made by Freewell. And if you want to know how to get this for free, I'll have information about that later in the video. I don't want to miss that. It's about $30 to get this set of ND filters that will help you control the shutter speed and that actually makes the video look much better. So in addition to the ND filters, you want to make sure that your go-to is mounted properly on your drone. And when I say properly, I mean you want to have it soft mounted so that it does not have any vibrations. So vibrations from the propellers and the motors that go into the camera causes, um, well, people call it jello, rolling shutter artifacts, etc., vibrations. It messes up the stabilization, causes weird things with the shutter speed, um, makes it look basically unwatchable if you have a lot of vibrations going in the camera. This is an example of a custom mount that I have um, for this one, it's the Crux 35. Your drone might be different, you might need a different mount. I'll, I'll link this one down in the uh, video description if you're interested, but you can see here the camera is vibration dampened with these TPU, this is actually a TPU mount. There's a little bit of flexibility to it, so it has a little bit of give. You don't want too much because that'll actually cause other problems. But uh, basically this isolates the camera from the drone's vibrations through these little legs. And that's what you what you want. So some sort of a mount that's gonna separate the camera from the drone physically. If the camera is directly mounted to the drone, that's where a lot of the problems come from in terms of vibrations and jello. You wanna avoid those kind of mounts. So here's another example of a soft mounted mount here. It's a little bit wiggly, a little bit more than I would like. This one came with the, I think it's the Diatone Taycan C25 Mark II. And uh, yeah, the camera just slides in here. You can adjust the angle on this one. Um, but you can see how it is, the camera is separated from the drone. There's, there's actual physical separation as well as this TPU does have a little bit of give and that also uh, absorb some of those vibrations from the drone and it gives you the best possible footage. All right, so the last element here is you want to go into the app and uh, actually go into your manual settings. And I'll, I'll actually show you all the little settings that I have adjusted here to get the footage that I get. Um, this is the most important part. This, you know, the manual settings combined with the ND filters to control your shutter speed are the key to getting the best possible footage on this camera. So this, let's just go through the app here. Um, basically in terms of the picture profile or the color profile, I tend to uh, film everything in standard. I don't use Vivid because Vivid um, locks in the extra saturation and contrast when it's recording. I don't necessarily will recommend Log. Log is a very low contrast, low saturation picture profile. It does require a little bit more work to color grade that. I prefer using standard because it's a little bit easier. It's not as saturated and doesn't have as much contrast as the Vivid color profile. But if I feel like I want to add a little bit of extra saturation, a little bit of extra contrast, it's fairly easy to do and it's not baked into the footage. So that's why I record in the standard color profile. So for the field of view, I uh, I actually record everything in wide. You can adjust all this in post and I'm actually recording everything in the pro video mode, which is why uh, it doesn't really matter what the field of view is. 
Uh, by default, the camera from the factory, or you know, when you get it out of the box, when you, if you just you know um, use the default factory settings and just hit record as soon as it comes out of the box, it records in like this. Um, it's not. Uh, I guess it's sort of like a basic mode. I never use it, so I'm not really sure what it's called. But it's like basically like the like the standard mode that comes out of the camera, which basically has it's 1440p or 1080p video. Um, it is uh, has the stabilization baked into the footage, so the stabilization is okay for like casual use, you know, as a tiny action camera, but uh, for an FPV drone, I don't recommend it. The the footage is um, uh, the, the, for the state for the stabilization that's baked in uh, in the camera is not as good as doing the stabilization in post processing, which is why you should use the pro video mode. And so basically, over here, you go to the settings here, and then I pick 1440p. I generally record in 30 frames per second and 16 by 9. Of course, you can change the aspect ratio in post-processing. That's not really that important. But in terms of selecting your video mode, so there's going to be video, and then you want to select Pro Video Mode here down in the bottom. And then you can adjust your um, settings up here as well. And I believe that's the same. But as you can see here, when you're in Pro Video Mode, you get like the, the full sensor um, in, your, in the preview. Now, in terms of the frame rate, I like I said, I generally record in 30 frames per second, and I will only record in 50 frames per second if there's for some reason I want to slow the footage down. Most of the time, that's not the case, um, and I, I avoid that because if you do 50 FPS, it uh, has less recording time. It tends to get uh, the camera gets a lot warmer. Um, and it, it eats up more space on the storage that's built into the camera, so I tend to not use that. Okay, so then now you want to set up your manual settings. So over here to the right of the record button, there's this auto mode. I'm going to click on that. So right now it's in basically auto settings. And if you don't really understand camera settings too much, what you can do is uh, on a really sunny day, just go with the ND64 and just stick with auto. Generally you'll get some decent results that way, but if you want to tweak it a little bit further, uh, then uh, you know you want to continue watching. So most of the time I am using ISO priority mode instead of auto, so let's slide that over. And then I'll lock in my ISO. If it's a really bright day, I'll lock it into something like ISO 100. You know, as, as you get a, a larger ISO here, you can get uh, a brighter image when it's darker outside, but you get more noise in the video, which is actually which you actually not good. So in the in most cases, I'll be at 100 or 200. If it's a little bit of a, a darker day, uh, kind of depends. Most of the time, I'm at ISO 100. You can mess around with the uh, EV settings here to adjust uh, in camera negative if you want it darker or positive if you want the image brighter, but I generally don't mess with the EV setting. The white balance is um, by default set to auto, but most of the time when I'm outdoors and it's sunny outside, I'll set it to 5,000. If you want it to be cooler, I set it to 4,000. If you want it to be warmer, then you can set it to about 6,500, or you can go with auto. But when you do auto and you're moving around and like when you're flying around stuff, your white balance might be shifting around and some people find that to be un unpleasant. So I usually tend to lock it at 5,000. Now, if you want to go full manual, you can do that. And then here you can set your ISO and your shutter speed. So at 30 frames per second, you want to generally follow the 180 rule and have double the frame rate. So at 30 frames per second, you want to have a one over 60 shutter. And that will actually give you the, the most um, pleasing looking motion blur, which is what you're after. So uh, if you're using the ND filters, uh, you, you, you know, when you, what I do is I'll try out a ND filter and, and at the place that I'm flying at and see what it looks like. So just an example here, I'm showing an ND32. Uh, pretty sunny day, a little bit of clouds in the, in the sky, but you know, I want to see what the shutter speed like and what the image looks like at that shutter speed. But because I almost never fly full manual, I'll usually fly ISO priority. 
I, w I actually like to have the uh, shutter speed to be a slightly variable around you know the ideal 180 degrees so uh, I don't lock it in most of the time sometimes I will sometimes I won't but um, for the most part I'll, I'll let it I'll, I'll fly in ISO priority mode and let the shutter speed um, uh, kind of float around a little bit because as you're flying through a scene you're going to go through some slightly brighter areas and slightly darker areas and um, having that shutter speed uh, have a little bit of variability in that shutter speed actually looks better to me. Some people would prefer the, the scene to get actually a lot darker when you go into those darker areas. So if you prefer that then go full manual try and try and find the right ND filter for the lighting conditions and kind of go with that. You know, but at the end of the day, it's kind of a personal preference. You, you know, you gotta kind of play with it, you know, test, take some test footage, see, you know, what you like, what you don't like. If it's, you know, we, you know if, if it's something, if it's a sort of a, a, a image that it, is looking good to you, then you kind of go with it. If you don't like it, then maybe you want to tweak it a little bit. Um, sometimes uh, in terms of the ND filters, uh, you probably want to go with more versus less on this camera. So I don't know what it is about this sensor, but it tends to run kind of hot. And um, I think it, it favors more shadow detail over highlight detail. So what it does is it blows out the highlights and brightens up the shadows. So you have, you're able to see more shadow detail in the, in the basically the, the sensor. And so if you want to bring, you know, if you want to basically bring down the highlights more so it's not so blown out, you want to use more ND filters. So if we're really sunny day, you want to go definitely with ND64. Otherwise, your your highlights get kind of blown out uh, if you use a little bit less. Although you get more shadow details. So it kind of really depends on what you're looking for. I found that on a really sunny day, ND64 is kind of necessary, and you know it doesn't totally blow out the highlights, but in and then you, you still get quite a uh, bit of shadow detail in, uh, with an ND64. Sometimes if there's a little, there's just some little bit of clouds in the sky, I'll go with ND32, but then, you know, when you're kind of pointing right at the sun and stuff, you'll get a lot of blown out highlights and even with an ND32. So for me, I personally prefer to go darker versus um, over bright or overexposed because you might be able to bring out some of those shadow details in post. Um, if, if the scene's a little bit underexposed, but if it's overexposed, there's, there's no way to bring back any of those details in the, in the highlights, they're just gone. So um, if you want to play with that in post-processing, I tend to go a little bit darker, and if I need to um, bring up the, shadow, shadow, um, the details in the shadows, I can do that in post-processing when I do the color grading. So another thing to note about um, when you're going with the manual settings is, or if you lock in the shutter and the ISO, if you're going in from bright areas to dark areas, um, you're going to get some very, you know, basically either if you if you basically expose it correctly for the bright areas, when you go when you fly into the dark areas, it's you're not going to be able to see anything. It's going to be completely dark. So uh, that's another reason why sometimes you may want to go with like an ISO priority of like say uh, 400. To, so uh, so when you do fly into the dark areas, you can bring out some of those, you know, basically it'll brighten up the image a little bit with, with basically a little bit of noise added versus just getting all just black and, and like pretty much an unusable image. So that's another reason why I kind of like to use ISO priority because sometimes you fly under bushes or trees and it's pretty dark. And if you lock your shutter in and when you come out and pop into the sun, yeah, everything looks nice and uh, properly exposed, but then when you're going to those bushes and those trees, everything's really dark, you can't see anything. Okay, a couple more things here in the app. Uh, for obviously for FPV footage, I tend to use the FPV stabilization instead of flow state stabilization. If with, with flow state stabilization, you're gonna get the horizon lock, so that might be useful for cinema whooping. Uh, but for most uh, FPV footage, you wanna use FPV stabilization. That'll give you the best results and it'll look actually the most natural. And then I tend to use the ultra wide field of view for the go-to. I don't know for, for whatever reason that looks pretty good to me in terms of the maximum field of view vertically and horizontally with um, you know the best stabilization. And the last thing is when I go and export the video, um, I tend to export it in ProRes 422, which is a very high bitrate codec. It basically preserves all the data, the data in the, um, the video 
without any loss. You can export it at a high bitrate in H.264 as well, although sometimes even at like 100 megabits, 120 megabits, it can still have some losses, especially if it's like high speed footage. And especially if you're going to um, be exporting it for uh, re-editing, for color grading, etc., you definitely want to export it in ProRes 422. That will give you the best results. It's an intermediate codec. Obviously, it's not something you're going to export and then upload to Facebook because it's going to be a huge file. But you can use that, put it into your video editor, you know, uh, color grade it, crop it, whatever you need to do, you know, you know in terms of uh, bring, you know, bringing out the best video in post-processing. And I, for me, I tend to just, you know, um, do a little bit of color grading and just add a little bit of extra saturation, a little bit of extra contrast, and I'm usually good to go there. But if you aren't going to be doing any kind of video editing or additional processing on it, you can export it in H.264. Um, the native bitrate in the camera is like 60 megabits. So uh, if you're going to like export it into Facebook or YouTube directly at this point, you can export it at like, say, 65 megabits and then upload it directly to YouTube and your results should be pretty good. OK, so that's going to do it for this video. Hopefully I've covered all of the bases here. If you have any additional questions, let me know and maybe I'll make a follow up video to this one. But this should cover most of the things you need to do to get the best quality video footage out of this camera. Now, if you're wondering how to get the ND filters for free, which is a must have, in my opinion, you really don't want to be flying FPV drones with this camera without the ND filters. Um, if you don't have the camera and you're considering buying it, use my link down in the video description. You'll get the ND filters for free as well as an extra set of lens guards for free. It's a, it's a $30 plus $10. It's a basically a $40 value added if you use the link down in the video description. That'll take you to the uh, Insta360 store. They're giving a special bonus uh, of the ND filters plus the lens guards to my viewers. And uh, if you're thinking about getting this camera and you and you're where you know maybe you're on the fence, you weren't sure if you can get really good footage or not, uh, and you know now you think you might be able to with these ND filters, definitely give it a go. Um, you know that's what I've been doing. I, I haven't really been doing doing anything special other than what I've mentioned in this video. It's not that difficult. So yeah, check it out. Uh, the link's down in the video description. If you found the video helpful, please give this video a thumbs up. It will uh, help the YouTube algorithm sort of give, you know, it gives the YouTube algorithm some hints as to whether or not this is a good video for other people and it will share with other people and hopefully it'll help them as well. That's good for this one and I'll talk to you guys in the next video.